welcome everybody here to Tuesday Night Talks. This is our eighth week of Tuesday Night Talks. Really, really excited um, for this evening's program. Uh, my name is Matt Elkin. I'm here with Scott Martin. We're here from West Coast Elite Basketball and Attitude of Gratitude Consulting. Um, we are so excited to have you guys here tonight um, and really excited to introduce our first guest of the evening, Coach Joe Riley from Wesleyan. Um, he's, he's been a good friend of mine, known him for a while, um, seen him all over the, the place on the road recruiting and um, does a really, really nice job with his program and has been doing it for a while with a lot of success. So uh, Coach Riley, welcome to the show tonight. Thanks. I appreciate the invitation. I'm excited to, to chat. Yeah, I know. We're, we're really happy to get you, get you on here and appreciate you staying up a little, a little late on the East Coast for us. Um, so just, just so everybody's clear, if you guys have any questions for, for Coach Riley or for any of our coaches tonight, feel free to, to ask those below in the chat box. We'll try to get those addressed as best as we can. But if you also take a look down below, you'll see we included Coach Riley's email in there as well. So if you guys have any follow-up questions or you want to follow them on social media, please feel free to do so. Um, but without further ado, Coach, um, if you can, just take a couple of minutes and give us a little bit of background kind of about your journey in coaching and kind of what brought you to Wesleyan um, to get started. Sure, thanks. It's, yeah, it's been a, a great journey. I feel really blessed to be at Wesleyan. I just wrapped up my, my 12th year as the head coach of the Wesleyan Cardinals. Uh, prior to being at Wesleyan, I was the head coach of Bates College in Lewiston, Maine for 11 years. And I was a, a student athlete at Trinity College in the NESCAC. So there, there are 11 NESCAC schools. It's an awesome conference. I've experienced uh, college basketball at three of the 11. And it's been, yeah, it's been a, it's been a heck of a journey. I, when I arrived at Wesleyan, it was, uh, there was an interim coach. So I was the third coach in three years. And uh, it was a bit of a rebuild. They, they, they were struggling a little bit. And uh, in, in, in the NESCAC, is, uh, you know, and at Wesleyan, a, a very highly selective academic school, it, it's, it's a process to get it going. You know, you're not, you don't get hired and you, you, you get transfers. And, and so you, we had a, a roster full of great guys, and, uh, we, but we needed to upgrade the talent level and, and uh, start off with a great recruiting class. And if you look back at the 12 years, I'm really proud of the product that we've been able to put on the floor. And we've... Uh, you know, if you look at the, the most successful seasons in the history of Wesleyan basketball over 100 years, five of those top of the top six seasons have been in you know since I arrived here. So we take a lot of a lot of pride in that. Yeah, definitely. No, you've you've brought a ton of success, and um, you know, like you said, 12 years at Wesleyan, um, but five straight NESCAC getting to the championship game. So you've had a lot of success in a really difficult league, as you mentioned. Um, and then you touched a little bit on your experience coaching at Bates as well in the same league. So, you know, tell us kind of just about the academic profile of Wesleyan and kind of what type of a school it is from an academic standpoint. So it's interesting. All the, all the NESCAC schools are, are, are similar in a lot of ways, but they all have their unique differences in, in their own niche. And when I compare myself to the other NESCAC schools and, and Wesleyan, there are two universities. It's Wesleyan University and Tuff, Tufts University. And enrollment-wise, we're the second largest behind Tufts. We have about 3,000 undergraduate students. And uh, like all of our NESCAC peers, it's, it's highly selective academics. Uh, we're in Middletown, Connecticut. We're, we're geographically 90 miles outside of New York City and about 90 miles outside of Boston. So we're halfway in between. And uh, Middletown is a small city right on the Connecticut River. And I think it has a lot to offer. It's a great community. Uh, it has a great downtown area. It's a working downtown, got some great restaurants, but we ha also have a, a vibrant campus life. So it's a, it's a terrific location. And, and academically, one thing I think that separates us from the other schools is we have an open curriculum. Uh, mm -hmm. And an open curriculum means that, that once you arrive at Wesleyan, you're not, you're not required to take any classes it, it's it's wide open and and because of that most of my student athletes are double majors or uh, have a, a major and a minor because from their arrival on campus they're they're gravitating towards classes that really interest them or they're they're taking a lot of classes that they think might interest them and they're doing a lot of exploring so when they're declaring a major by the end of their sophomore year a lot of times they're like well i'm leaning towards economics but uh, boy, I've, you know, I've, 
I really have an interest in music and I've taken some, some music classes as well. So I'm almost like halfway to a major in both. So let, let me be a double major. So uh, that's, that's a real unique thing. And, and I think overall, when you're looking at Wesleyan University, the way I describe it, it's just a, a, real, a real vibrant community where people are really have a lot of intellectual curiosity and they're uh, really eager to, to, to grow and, and explore and, and take those four years and figure out what they're going to do at after life after Wesleyan. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's really cool. I, I think that definitely separates you guys from a lot of the other awesome schools in your league. And, and another way that you guys separate yourself is, you know, having a lot of success on the basketball court too. So um, sh tell me a little bit just about the program and kind of what you've been able to do in, you know, um, over a decade there at Wesleyan. And then um, I, I think we have some highlights that I'm going to share with the group. Um, but yeah, just touch on it real quick, uh, just about on the basketball side of things. Yeah, so you know, a rebuild is always tough. When you when you take over a rebuild in the NESCAC, it, it's really tough. Oh, and, yeah. uh, and, and because you know, I think I think there's some places where you can get competitive in your league, and and then the next step is you try to get competitive nationally. And, and in the NESCAC, if you want to be competitive in the NESCAC and be in the top tier, then you're going to have to be able to compete at, at a national level. And and Wesleyan has a, a unique relationship with both Williams and Amherst. We, we create uh, what we call a little three rivalry. Mm. And it was actually, it was actually a small three team league that it was established in 1910. So the rivalry goes really deep. So okay. every year we, we have a, a little three championship. And I remember when I was, when I was hired at, at, at Wesleyan and I went into the athletic director and, 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 uh, and I'm telling them, and he's saying, hey, so what's the expectation? How are we going to win here? And I'm like, well, do you understand that we play Amherst and Williams twice? We, we, in the NESCAC, we play a single round robin, but because of the rivalry, we play those schools twice. And, and, uh, and I say, well, you understand that we're going to have to get a little support here for, because if we can't be the top 10 team in the country, we're going to start every year 0-4 because <laughs> uh, they're, they're that good. So we, we, uh, we've, we've either had a share of one and, and captured three little three championships and in the last five years and it was a 20 year drought before I arrived there, but uh, that's a great rivalry. And, 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 you know, everyone in this league can really score. And I think we can, we can, we can score with them, but I, I'm always looking through the defensive lens. That's kind of been our niche that we, that we really guard. And, and uh, obviously we want guys who can put the ball in the basket, but we love guys who can, who can really guard and defend multiple positions and, and, as a coach, developing the, the defensive side is really gratifying, and guys come in as prolific scorers. And then I always joke with them by the time, like, the end of their sophomore year, I'm like, wow, you can really guard now. I don't think you've guarded before you arrived here in Middletown, Connecticut. <laughs> so so that's, been, that's been a fun aspect of it as well. well. Yeah. No, that's awesome. And I know, you know, you've had a lot of great players come through. I mean, one, one that jumps out to me is, is Harry Raffrey. I mean, he was, he was a stud. Um, I remember – you know, going up against him back in the day and seeing him at camps and was always just grinding. And I, if, if I'm correct, he had a chance to kind of play a little bit in the, was it in the, in the G league or, or the D league? He had a couple workouts and stuff. That's pretty cool. Yeah, he did. Raf, Raf, the man, he, he was a big part of hanging banners in our gym. He, he yeah. was a real uh, culture changer. And, and uh, when, when he arrived at, at Wesley and I knew that great things were going to happen. And he did, he, after, after Wesley and being an all NESCAC player, he did play in the G league. And now he is a uh, GA, he's an assistant coach at University of Michigan on the women's side. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, he's, he's doing great things. And, you know, and, and as a coach, you know, the success is about the people that you bring into your pro program. And I've been blessed to have, a, have some really great people decide that Wesleyan it was going to be their four-year college destination. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Well, I'm going uh, to share my screen with everybody, and we're going to give you guys a little taste of uh, – kind of what Wesleyan basketball looks like. So let me pull this up real quick. Bear with me one second. All right, sharing my screen. Where are we at? Here we go. All right. You guys all see this? All right, let's let it rock.
That was awesome. That was really cool. Good stuff. Well, obviously, you guys share the rock. Great atmosphere. I've actually been in, in the gym at Wesleyan, and great atmosphere for games there. Um, so tell us a little bit, what, which, what year was that from? What was that team all about? And just tell us a little bit about kind of what some of the people saw in that video. Yeah, so that was from two years ago. That was the, the uh, at the at the time, that was the, the best season in the history of Wesleyan basketball. And, and that was a clip. We brought a video crew in because we hosted the, a pod in the first and second round of the NCAA tournament. So that was an exciting time. We we uh, advanced all the way to the NESCAC finals that year. Uh, we lost in the finals in a, in, a, in a tough game, but then we were still granted because of our season. We were granted the, to host the NCAA tournament. We lost a tough game to Swarthmore in the, in the, in the second round, but it was great. And it, it wasn't just that team. It was, it was a lot of the guys that, that came before to lay the foundation to, to, to make that happen. You know, it's a, it, it, was a, it was a progress. And it was, it was fun for me as the leader of the program to be able to reach out to the players that had all wore a uniform and, and believed in the vision that that could actually happen at Wesleyan and call them up and say, Hey, thanks for, you know, thanks for believing in the vision back in, you know, 2000, 2009, when I met you in, 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 in coming to Wesleyan and instead of joining a program where you could have added a, another banner of many on the wall, you came to a place to, to, uh, to put up a banner that in a, in a, in a wall that had no banners. So, and I like to talk about the guys there, not only, not only what they're doing, you know, doing on the court there, but what they're doing after Wesleyan. So Jordan Bonner was an all NESCAC player. He was a defensive player of the year. He, he was studying in Cambridge, England this past year, and he's already on his way to get his PhD in, in psychology. He's just a, just an amazing, amazing, amazing young man from Houston, Texas. And, and then Nathan Krills from Napa Valley, California. He was one of the, one of the guys dunking it there. And he had a, a great professional year in, in Holland this past year. He actually had a had a medical redshirt, and he used his graduate year to play at the University of San Francisco. Oh wow! And, uh, and uh, coach, he played for Coach Smith there, and and uh, Coach Smith loved him. He he had he unfortunately got injured and didn't get a chance to do much on the court, but he he really made an impression. Uh, coach Kyle Smith said he had a lot of credibility being a NESCAT guy <laughs> and, and having a NESCAT guy being that good coming in the and in, in, in playing and he, and helping the team compete. And uh, Jordan Sears, he's the one who caught the alley oop dunk or, or the uh, tip dunk. He's uh, through Wesleyan Connections. He he went with Greg St. Jean to St. John's and got his master's at at, at St. John's University as a GA, and and now he's an assistant coach with the Milwaukee Bucks. Wow. So uh, yeah, it's just amazing what these guys are doing. Just as young guys, it's 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 fun. They're not only just great basketball players, but they're 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 great people and they're super ambitious. Yeah, for sure. And and I know. Um... A guy out this way, uh, my buddy Steve, the head coach at Campbell Hall School here in L.A., he's a Wesleyan alum. We have a guy, a buddy of mine, Shasha, who's down at uh, Vanderbilt. So there's a, there's a ton of people in the Wesleyan alumni network that are in sports and outside. So that's obviously really, really cool. Um, I'm going to toss it over to, uh, to Scotty, and I'll have a couple more questions for you, Coach Riley. Great. Coach, appreciate you being on tonight. Um, the first real question we have is, where do you do a majority of your recruiting? Do you utilize the Ivy League camps, tournaments, high school ball? Um, obviously, it's a unique year with none of that going on. But in a normal year, where, where, where do you tend to send your guys out to recruit? Uh, you know, the Ivy League camps are great. The, the, it's, that's a great resource for us. Those coaches are doing a, a great job. Geographically, where we're located, we're, we're super close to, to most of the, uh, the Ivy League camps. So, you know, Yale University is about 25 minutes away from – I live six miles off, off of the Wesleyan campus, and, and Yale's about 25 miles away, and Brown's an hour and 10-minute drive away. But all the coaches do a great job. The Ivy League camps has been a real game changer. You know, being a, being a head coach in the NESCAC for 23 years, it's really, it's really changed. So uh, – and, and that's been – I think that's really, really enhanced our league because I think we're just involved with a pool of players that, that are from – that are from out of region and we're actually not getting to see them play live. Obviously with the pandemic, it's, it's changing things a little bit, but you know, AAU is, is, is great as well in the camp settings. It, it, sometimes at division three, you're limited by budget. So we're not, we're not hopping on planes as much as we would like to go to go see, to go see players. But, you know, I think, I think it's, it's, it's constantly changing and flowing and, and uh, 
we really want a diverse roster and part of that diversity is is also geographic diversity you know growing up in different pockets of the country you bring a different perspective to campus and to our team and and, and we really value that so so uh you know we try to use every avenue possible that we that we can to uh, to to find our players what about in this environment what's the best way for a, a potential recruit on this call to get on your radar get in contact with you yeah these are some challenging times and uh for you know for a lot of people on a lot of different levels and and uh and and i have some compassion for for student athletes who are who are preparing for you know the biggest decision of their life and and, and unfortunately you can't go and walk on a campus and, and and meet with a coach face to face but these are the circumstances that everybody's dealing with and my advice is is be as proactive as you can and uh you know, I, I like highlight films. We're as coaches, you know, we're getting a lot of hits in the inbox right now for from from athletes, and and, and I love it. I love it. I love I love hearing from 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 players, and and uh, I think one of the other things to do is 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 follow up because because we're getting a lot of hits. It's you know uh, how are you going to sort out how are you going to like even just today I probably got maybe six or seven you know like not generic, but like very thoughtful, personal emails to coach, to coach Riley saying that they'd like me to, 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 put, you know, get on, get on my radar. And, uh, and it can get a little bit overwhelming at the end of the day, we like to recruit players who really, who really are excited about us. So, uh, so I think, I think follow up and is, is also really important. Have you guys gone test optional and, and what is kind of like the academic profile you look like you look for in a potential recruit? So Wesleyan made the decision in 2014 to go test optional. So is, and that's been a game changer because when I was at Bates College for 11 years uh, for that entire time we were test optional and I really felt like it, it expanded our ability to, to recruit really great students who sometimes just don't test well. So right. I, I just think we like, and, and then Wesley, and I think it's really progressive thinking that they went that way. And, uh, but it's a, it's a holistic approach. It's the, the recruiting, the, the application process is a process. So, you know, we want, we want a, a strong transcript, but you know, our acceptance rate, the last I checked was like 16% and we're getting about 12,000 applications. So it's, it's super selective. Uh, rigor, you know, AP classes are, are, are really important. And, uh, you know, you want a high GPA and the, the scores can help you. So we encourage everybody to test. And uh, one of the advantages you have in as an athlete, if, if your, your score is, is, real, is good, but it's not off the charts and you're not sure if it's going to help you or, or it's going to hurt you, you can, you know, you can use your coach at Wesleyan who can go through a liaison and get some, and get some feedback if it would strengthen your application or not but but uh i like the fact i'd rather judge someone's four-year performance than a four-hour performance on a saturday afternoon and <laughs> and uh and That's so, cool. I, so so i'm i'm I'm, ex, I'm excited about that I, I think it takes the pressure off off uh student athletes too a little bit yeah. now you see everyone doing you got harvard going test optional princeton going test optional. I mean, you know the, the environment's different but i mean you guys are definitely ahead of the curve on that one yeah. You know, as a coach, sometimes if you, if you, when, when I first, be, moving from base to Wesleyan and we, when we were, when we were, were not test optional, it made my job a little bit easier because you could just cross people off the list because of poor, because of poor tests. So it actually, it made my pool a little bit smaller where it, when it's, when you're not test, when you're not test optional, it, it makes it, you know, you're looking at a transcript, but you don't know the rigor. You got to get the school profile. You don't know how many APs are offered and you don't know, you know, what the school grouping is going to be and how many kids from that school are applying. Cause that matters. It just gets, it's, it's a little, it's a little more work, but I'll take that more work if it gives people more, you know, if it makes like a place like Wesley more accessible. Oh, 100%. And the, the, the last question, I know we have a couple other things to get to is um, talk about your team's international trips. I thought that was really cool. I know a lot of schools don't do that. That that's a huge part of the student athlete experience. Can you talk about why you do that and the whole experience? Yeah, so I I, uh, I personally love to travel. My 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 uh, my lovely wife is, actually lived in Portugal. She she didn't move to this country until she was eleven, and, and there's family over there. So I try to get over get over and see her family as as much as I can. And and uh, I was 
I, I had a pr pretty simple childhood. I, I, I never hopped on an airplane until I was in till I was in college and bought my own airline ticket. But then right after school, I, I did Eurorail for a month in Europe and it, with a with a college teammate. And it, I just I just I just loved it. And 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 I and I know that that studying abroad is a, is a big part of the college experience for a lot of for a lot of students. Mm -hmm. But being a, a college basketball player overlapping both semesters, it's, it's really it's really difficult. So I actually had the wheels in motion to try to do something. I'm not sure if I was going to be able to swing it this spring, but we, right before the pandemic hit, I told the guys like, Hey, like I have this in the works, but we might have to press pause. I had no idea that what was coming down the, down the, the train track here in terms of everything being shut down. But yeah, the last trip we did, we went to Taiwan and, and that was just an amazing experience. Uh, amazing. It was, and, and I brought my, my base team, we were in Ireland and we were in England and, and uh, my first team experience was with, was with the Yale team. This was a while ago when I was an assistant coach at Yale university, went to Spain and uh, on every trip I like to do, I like to, I like to volunteer when we're over there, we do youth clinics and, and that's the best part. Cause you really get into the community, you get with the youth, you get in the gym and it's, it, it's really, it's really cool. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's, that's really cool coach. I, uh, I'm glad Scotty asked that question because I was reading that in your bio too. I think that's just an amazing opportunity to get to travel the world. And I think there's a lot of people on this call that maybe might, might never have been on a plane before, like you said, until they get to college and then having that opportunity to travel, it's, it's pretty special. Um, I wanted to take a couple of minutes and just talk to you. Obviously, you know, you and I spoke a little bit offline here, but um, you have a son who, who plays college basketball right now um, and is not too much older than a lot of the kids on this call. We also have some parents on this call. So if you could just take a couple minutes and tell us a little bit about like what that experience was like for you having your son be recruited to play at a lot of high academic schools and how he kind of ended up where he is now at Holy Cross and just what that was like for you as as a dad, but also maybe as a coach and having some inside scoop on how the whole process works. What, you know, how was that for you? And what is some advice that you have for kids going through a similar process? Yeah, well, it's, it's an easy answer that it's way more stressful as a parent <laughs> in the recruiting process than, than, than a coach, but, but it was fun. Yeah. I'm very proud of my son, Joey. He's uh, he had a, a great experience at Holy Cross as a freshman. You know, they didn't win as many games as they wanted, but, but uh, it was great. He had a, a great connection with the coaching staff. And the process was really interesting. Uh, and, and as he was going, the message that I told him all the time was, like, the goal is, is always to, as much as you can, is to stay in the present. Like, you have to think about your future, but it, it, and it, it can get stressful, but you have to stay in the, in the present. So, you know, it started as he was a freshman. And I was like, hey, Joey, like, 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 try to make the JV team. Like if you can make the JV team as a freshman, that would be great because yeah. then you might be able to get in and, and, and practice with the varsity. Cause it's about, it's really about getting better and just being the best you can be. And then, you know, and then, and then going into his senior year, it, it's like, Hey, like have the best season that you possibly can. Like there's, there's no college experience. Like if you, if you want to be, if you want to be a, a prospect at an elite college program, you have to be an elite high school player. That's what you, that's what that, that, that's first. And I think if you focus on that, and I think sometimes, and, and I really try to fight this and it's human nature is that you, you can get so caught up in what you're doing next year and where you're going to college that you're not enjoying your senior year, like your senior year. And, and that's why this pandemic to me, like it, 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 and it hits in so many different ways, but you know, for, for, for the high school seniors who can't finish out their high school career for it, for, for me having Joey's my oldest of four kids and, and they all miss their seasons in the spring and, and thank goodness none of them was a senior. Cause that's tough. It's, it's yeah. really tough, but I think staying in the present and for the, for the parents, it's, it's really challenging not to, not to, not to drive the, drive the bus on it, on it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's your child's journey and, and you have to, you have to let them drive it. And, you know, I had, I had a lot of information, but I had a rule with, with Joey's like, I was going to share that information when he asked hmm. or when it was absolutely necessary, you know, <laughs> but I think, it, it, but it, it, I think it gets stressful right up to the, right up to the point where you have to make a decision. And then I think the way life works, at least for me, is that when it, the closer you get to decision, it, 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 things become pretty clear at the, at the end. Yeah. So, well, I, and I'm also curious, I, I'm, 
I wonder if it adds more or less stress to have your brother, his uncle, be his high school coach and uh, whether that makes things easier or whether, you know, there's a lot of phone calls between you and him saying, hey, I need, you know, I need more offers for my son or no, you know, back and forth. Uh, <laughs> you guys going going at it. But uh, no, that, that's a it's a really cool story. And I think that was some great kind of great insight from sure for a lot of the players and the parents. Yeah, no, it was, yeah, him playing for his uncle was interesting. It made it easier. His record, his four-year record, he ended up being a four-year starter and, and his career record was 104 and seven. So I think my brother, my, my, my brother was happy most of the time, but it was, <laughs> it was interesting. I, uh, I stayed, I stayed completely away and, and just, and just took a step back. And, and now that he's graduated, I can now go back to going to attend his high school practices, <laughs> which I, which I love to do. But I go. took a, a four-year hiatus from that. Yeah, no, he's he's done uh, an amazing job building up his program there in Connecticut. Um, well, we, we have a couple more minutes here, Coach, and, and uh, another thing that we had kind of talked about that I wanted to touch on is this really cool initiative um, that some of your players and, and some of the guys at Wesleyan had uh, kind of started called Athletes Taking Action, and it's kind of um, grown and developed out of, you know, some of the um, social injustice that we've been seeing in our country as of late. So, um, if you can touch on it just for a couple of minutes, tell us a little bit about this initiative um, and how kind of it started within your team and how it's kind of grown and expanded even nationwide to this point. Yeah, so I'm extremely proud of of our team and and our team leaders and the initiative they've taken. So they've they've created, uh, you know, a movement. Athletes take action, and it, it's to a, it's a campaign to raise awareness via social media, mostly Instagram. And they're targeting uh, college teams, and it's trickled down to high school as well, uh, to encourage them to 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 have a platform to to, to raise money and donate it to a cause that's going to raise more awareness to, to Black Lives Matters and 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 help create a more anti-racist uh, society. So when uh, I know when there was a lot of unrest and. In in our country, we got got on a Zoom call, and it, it was it was a, a very emotional call, and it was you know we're all learning from each other, we're doing a lot of listening, and and uh, and and the players are like, hey, we want to do more, and and I think it, it's a it's a direct relationship to the type of education they're getting at Wesleyan, like at, at Wesleyan, you, it's it's such a vibrant community, and and you're really empowered at Wesleyan to to really to really voice your opinion and and take action, and yep. so. They put their head together, and it was it was all player driven. And to raise over fifty thousand dollars in a, in a few weeks, and and uh, and I think the it's only gain, just get, continues to gain momentum. So uh, yeah, just just extremely extremely proud of them. They've got our alumni have been backing them, and and uh, and are supporting their cause, and other teams within within Wesley Athletics are supporting it. So uh, it's it's gaining a lot of traction. And, and as a coach. I'm sitting back and watching this. I'm like, wow, like, like this generation and, and these guys, you know, the ages between 18 and 22 are, are, are making, a, making, making a, a real difference. And, and I'm really proud, really proud of that. Yeah, no, it's, it's amazing, Coach. I know we had talked about it, and there's an article. If, if anybody's curious to learn more information, um, we put it in the chat box. Um, there's the link to, to read more about Athletes Take Action. And I'm also, I'm sure you can search it online. You can follow them on Instagram. It's ATA challenge at ATA challenge. Um, and you can learn about them and follow them and support them. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's a really, it's really, really cool coach that not only it was a student led initiative, but your students really feel empowered to have that voice and to, to get together on, on a cause like that, which is, which is amazing. I know a lot of that's happening. And for a lot of the young people here on the call, it's just a reminder that you guys all have a voice and, and you guys can use it in a lot of different ways. So I think that's amazing that, that your players got to do that. Yeah. Thanks. And you, you know, it, it, I'm also really proud of like, like they reached out to players at Williams and Amherst and, and we have this, this, this great rivalry and, <laughs> and uh, you know, it, 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 I mean, intense rivalry, but all of a sudden this happens and I'm hearing my players that they're that, that, like guys from Amherst and Williams and Wesley and they're all working together and, and, and they're getting involved too. And it just, it just shows you the power of sport in, uh, in, in athletics and in, in, in a difference that we can make. Definitely. No, that's, that's really special coach. And um, well, we're, we're running low on time here, but is there anything else we didn't get a chance to, to touch on that you wanted to, to talk about briefly before we uh, sign off here for the evening? You know, I, I just want to just thank you for having for having me on the call and 
and uh, and for all those players and parents out there that that uh, it can be a stressful time, but if you want to use me as a resource, be happy to. I feel like I'm a, an ambassador to the game, and 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 uh, and I just love Division Three basketball. I love the NESCAC, what it represents, and and uh, if I can help anyone in any way, you know, you know, we don't bring in huge recruiting classes, but you can still in the recruiting process, you can touch a lot of people and and, and help them out. So. Uh, use me and other coaches as a, as a resource during these, during these tough times. Cause we're all, you know, our, our goal is the same. We want to, you know, we want to win basketball games, but more importantly, we want to impact the lives of young people and give them an opportunity to, 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 to grow in four years and then do special things after that. Yeah, no question. And, and yeah, like coach said, I, I've gotten to build in a great relationship with you, coach Riley, and, and I encourage all the players and the, the parents here, shoot him an email, his emails in the chat box, or you can go on the Wesleyan basketball website. You can find it easily. Definitely reach out to coach if you guys have more questions. Um, but can't thank you enough for being on with us tonight. This was great. This was a really interesting conversation and hopefully got some people excited about Wesleyan and um, I'm hope, hopeful that we'll get a chance to be back on the court soon enough. And, and when that time comes, hopefully uh, in all of your desire and interest in traveling, maybe you can make a trip out here to the West Coast. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Sign me up. I'm ready to move. Awesome. <laughs> I'm ready to be on the move. All right. Appreciate Thanks, you. Thanks, guys. Stay safe. Thanks. Have a good evening. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah. Oh, he's, oh and, he's, and he's got the home court, home court advantage behind him. I like the who. This is my, my six-year-olds and my soon-to-be four-year-olds. They've been they've been putting in work on this behind me, so we're uh, yeah. I figured, and this is where I like to sit too. So we're how are you guys doing? Everybody good? Yeah, we're good. How how are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm uh, I'm so impressed with Joe and and you know his program at Wesleyan. You know, listening to you know what his kids are doing right now, his student athletes. It's really it's pretty awesome. So I was I was glad to hear that. Yeah. No. We have definitely it was. That was a great talk, and, and we're really excited um, to have you here, Coach or Pat Doherty from uh, Haverford. Uh, is also a, a great buddy of ours, has, has worked a lot of our West Coast Elite basketball high academic camps in the past and um, has a pretty cool story to tell as well. So um, give us a little bit of insight, kind of what brought you to Haverford and um, kind of what your journey has looked like up until now. Sure. So I, um, I graduated from Lafayette College in 2004 uh, I had a very I had a brief kind of unremarkable uh, playing career there I wasn't recruited to play at Lafayette I walked on um, after I graduated from Lafayette I went to work for a nonprofit. Uh, it's called Peace Players and I lived and worked in Northern Ireland for a year um, working with uh, Protestant and Catholic kids who were in very much segregated communities. And I, I had a really, just an awesome experience working with peace players for a year. When I came back, that's when I started coaching. Uh, I was coaching high school for about two years in Bucks County. Uh, realized pretty quickly that I, um, I wasn't getting the level of intensity and uh, kind of love for the game um, that I was looking for as a coach at the high school level. So I, I started my college coaching career. I was at the College of New Jersey as an assistant coach for one year. Uh, I was at Williams College up in the NESCAC. I think that might have been Joe's first year at Wesleyan, maybe first or second year. I was up there as an assistant. Um, and then I made my way back to Lafayette where I was an assistant coach for eight years and uh, with, with Fran O'Hanlon, who I played for. Yep. Um, and then coached with for eight years. So we had uh, some really good teams at Lafayette, uh, won the Patriot League in, in 2015. Um, just an awesome experience, you know, coached in an NCAA tournament. Um, I won't tell you, you know, how the tournament went for us, but it was, it was fun getting there. Um, and then three years ago from, from Lafayette, uh, I was really fortunate to, to have the opportunity to come to Haverford and I just wrapped up my third year as the head coach at Haverford. We, um, we inherited a program that was, you know, struggling. You know, they had, they had won four games, I think, in back-to-back -back years. So we, um, you know, we've been building for three years. And, you know, through the hard work of a lot of 
a lot of guys, six of them who just graduated. Um, you know, we, we won 16 games this past year, made our conference tournament, and had one of the most successful years, you know, in the history of our program. So um, it's been a lot of fun at Haverford. I've learned a lot. Um, as you guys know, I mean, there's, there's incredible programs in the league, you know, um, you know, every, every year there's going to be top 10, 15 national programs in the centennial. Um, it's, you know, every, every night is a battle and I'm learning, uh, a ton every year. So that's kind of, at least from 2004 to now, that's, uh, that's been my, my journey. Yeah, no, you, you've done a great job. Like you said, in, in your time, um, you know, adding uh, the best finish in league play, the most win or second most wins, I believe, in, in school history with the program. So you're moving in the right direction. Um, and, and, you know, so on the basketball side, that's, that's great. And you're making great progress. What about on the, the, the school side? Talk a little bit about Haverford as a school, um, academics, kind of what, what makes it such a special place and something that attracted you, you know, also off the basketball court as well. Yeah, so Haverford, I mean, I grew up less than two hours from Haverford, and I didn't know a thing about the school uh, mm -hmm. until, you know, maybe five, six years ago. So it's not, um, you know, it's it, it might not be super well known, like even within, you know, our region of the country. But once I started learning um, about the college, about how unique it is, um, and I'll just say a couple things. So, so Haverford College is it's strictly undergraduate and it's 1,300 students and change. And if you look at the, the U.S. News and World Report, um, you know all the top 20, 25, you know liberal arts colleges are you know a little bigger or a lot bigger than Haverford. So it's definitely a small college. You get a small college experience at Haverford. At the same time. Um, you know, we happen to be in a consortium, um, they call it the Quaker Consortium, but if you're a student at Haverford, you can cross-register for classes at Bryn Mawr College, uh, Swarthmore College, and also the University of Pennsylvania. Oh, wow. um, so it's, it's well over, I think just in the Tri-College Consortium, which includes Bryn Mawr and SWAT, um, it's 2,000 classes that are available to, to Haverford undergrads. So it's kind of this unique place where it's it's very much a small college with a, with a small college feel and community feel, um, but it's big resources and it's only eight miles from from downtown Philadelphia. So it's not um, you know it's Philadelphia is very accessible from Haverford, which is which is cool. I mean, our, I know our guys um, not so much during the season, but when we're in the off season, they get into Philly quite a bit. So. Um, Haverford is, is a unique place. I mean, it's academically, I mean, it's one of the most, um, it's, I mean, like all the schools you guys are talking to, it's highly selective. It's very rigorous academically. I think uh, maybe more so than I knew a couple of years ago before I got to Haverford, it really attracts um, students who are interested in issues um, involving social justice. Um, and I've really learned that in a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with my current players over the past couple of weeks. Um, obviously, we're in a climate right now where um, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of conversations to be had and uh, people have to sort, sort through some things. Um, but it's a unique place. It's, um, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful and fortunate to, to be at Haverford. Um, I don't know that I could have gotten into Haverford um, when I was <laughs> in school, but, um, you know, to be around really smart kids who, you know, really care about our basketball program and being competitive um, has been a lot of fun for me over the past three years. That's awesome. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to throw it over to Scott Martin. He'll have a couple more uh, specific questions for you as well, coach. Coach, obviously we've seen each other at the Ivy league camps, West coast elite camps. I mean, you, you really recruit a large swath of the country. What do you look for in recruits and like, and what is your offensive defensive philosophy that um, those recruits kind of fit? Yeah. So um, we have seen each other a lot. I'm glad <laughs> for that. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, when I left Lafayette to come to Haverford, I knew that there was a lot of aspects of how we played at Lafayette that I wanted to bring um, bring with me to Haverford. It's not, um, it's not all of it. 
Um, it might not even be most of it, but the, the single biggest thing is we try to play a really, really unselfish style of basketball. We talk a ton about, um, and this is all, you know, from Coach O'Hanlon, um, you know, giving yourself up and, you know, being a connector on the floor. Coach O talks about being a connector all the time. And a lot of times, you know, basketball player, you might not realize how many different ways there are on the basketball court to really connect your teammates. Um, you know, obviously passing is one of them, but communicating, cutting, screening. Um, I think if you watch this play, that's, you know, one of the things that would jump out is, you know, we really try to move the ball and move ourselves. And, uh, and you know, hopefully, you know, when Coach L gets to watch us play, he's, he's proud of what he's looking at because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to coach, you know, like he coached the guys up at Lafayette while I was there. Um, yeah, I, I hope that answers your question a little bit about how we play. No, 100%. And, and what, what are the academic requirements? I know that there's the athletic portion, but, but they're at, Haverford is obviously one of the best academic schools in the country. So what do you look for on that respect? Are you guys test optional in this environment? or? So the, the college, just within the past month or so, just announced that we are in a three-year trial period of um, you know, becoming test optional, which – I'm really excited about. Um, I listened to Joe talk about, I know Wesleyan went test optional in 2014 and how that changed um, kind of his access to, to different student athletes across the country. And I'm optimistic that it'll be the same for us at Haverford. Um, I wasn't quite prepared for the level of student I was gonna need to recruit when I got to Haverford. I knew that I, knew that I needed smart kids, but um, it's on a whole different level than um, some of the other places I had been. So um, one thing I would say that's been um, particularly kind of important for me at Haverford in recruiting is I'm always looking um, at transcripts to try to figure out, you know, has this prospect challenged, him challenged himself to the greatest extent that he can? Um, Joe mentioned this earlier, but if I think for kids, if, if you're, if you're, ducking AP classes or IB curriculum, um, those are the types of things that inevitably show up in my conversations with admissions. They are really looking for kids, um, kid, young people, they're not kids, um, <laughs> who are um, you know, curious and want a, an academic experience that's really going to challenge them. Um, I think at Haverford, if you, know, if you were to show up at Haverford and all you really wanted was the credential of a degree and a basketball experience, you wouldn't get a whole lot out of it. Um, because from my conversations with the, the student athletes I've coached, um, you know, it's rigorous and, and you're challenged. Um, but yeah, to, to answer your question, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, you, you gotta have a lot of A's on your transcript. If you got a couple B's, there better be a good reason. Um, and you at Haverford, you still can submit test scores. Uh, if you have really strong ACT or SAT scores, you can submit those. But as of this year, you no longer have to. So um, I'm excited to see how that might um, kind of impact our recruiting process over the next couple of months. Just make sure that the kids are taking better classes in high school. That's the, that's the tougher part. Yep. Yeah, it's fun. I mean, I, I get emails all the time and, you know, you know, kids got a three nine or a four zero, and I know that until I look at the transcript and know a little bit more about the school, um, it's really not enough context to know if that particular student is going to be a, a viable candidate for Haverford. So um, and that's not just true at our place. That's true. At Wesleyan is true. At Grinnell, um, you know, we're all looking for, you know, just really talented student athletes. Um, and there's a reason, there's a reason student comes first in that phrase. I mean, it's, it's, we're looking for students first and then hopefully they can help us on the court um, once we coach them up a little bit. And being like a top 15 liberal arts school, I, I know the price tag gets, gets up there. What, what is the aid that's offered through your university? Yeah. So at Haverford over 50% of, students at Haverford receive some, some form of financial aid. All of the financial aid at Haverford is need-based financial aid. Um, so, and this is, I think this is probably true at Wesleyan and a lot of the other schools you've talked to, but um, 
you know, it really, it comes down to what type of financial circumstances your family's in. And, you know, Haverford, like a lot of the other top tier academic schools is, you know, committed to meeting 100% of what your need is. Mm -hmm. um, that's another exciting part of, of this for me because I can recruit. I don't, you know, I don't need to just hit up, you know, prep schools and boarding schools. You know, I can recruit all over the country, all over the world. Um, look for student athletes from all sorts of backgrounds and um, know that there's a chance because students that need a lot of financial aid, um, students like myself, you know, I was, I got a ton of need based financial aid when I was a student at Lafayette. If I had not gotten that aid, there's no chance in, you know what, I would have ended up at Lafayette. So um, Haverford's very similar, but it's, there's no, it's division three. So obviously there's no athletic scholarships. Um, there's no academic merit packages because everybody that ends up at Haverford is um, an outstanding student with big time yeah. academic credentials. So, um, but uh, to another thing I would say is, you know, for um, some of the, some of the kids and their parents who are on this call, one, one of the first things, you know, I think you should do when you're looking at these schools is, is go to the financial aid website and kind of start digging into the financial aid calculator at these schools because it's not going to give you a number you know to the penny but it's going to give you a sense of you know what an expected family contribution might be at a place like Haverford or Wesleyan or Grinnell and a lot of times that's a good way to start um, for a family to figure out like you know if, if this is going to be no, nobody wants to waste their time, waste six months or a year or two years in a recruiting process when, you know, at the end of the line, it's not, it's not possible financially. So um, I would definitely advise parents and, and students to start doing that early in the process. No, that's so true. I mean, we're, we're big, you know, division three proponents, and that's something you have to do early on just to make sure you're on the right path to the right school. Um, what are the main majors for your, your players? Is there anything, any um, similarities in majors that your players uh, take or is it across the board different? No, it's, it's, um, it's strange because I inherited a team that um, each class year was, was very different. Like my first seniors, um, all of them were economics majors. Or no, I'm sorry, this is my second class of seniors. Um, and one of them is working as an investment analyst for, uh, for JP Morgan now. Um, another one's working for Jeffrey's Bank, which is a, another investment bank in New York City. So I have those guys, my seniors who just graduated, um, at least three of those are pre-med guys. So um, they're looking at med school either next year or down the line. Um, so we'll have some doctors coming out of the program, which is nice because you know, I'm going to start breaking down here in, in the next couple of years. So I'll have some alums to, to fix me up um, when I need surgeries. Um, and then, as I said earlier, like Haverford, um, there's a lot of kids that are attracted to Haverford um, because of the social justice component. We actually have an entire academic, um, it's not a department, it's bigger than a department, but it's called the Center for Peace and Global Citizenship. So there are a ton of kids that come through Haverford that, um, you know, pursue, you know, Fulbright fellowships or, you know, go to work for the Peace Corps or AmeriCorps, you know, after they, after they finish it up. Um, and I have found that a lot of my guys, I mean, they, they have a lot of ambition when it comes to, you know, things that they can do to change the world and impact the world, you know, for good. And it's not just at Haverford. Um, and it's not just wherever they're from. So um, that's, a, that's a long answer, but the, sh the short answer is, yeah, we have, we have you know, student, students who are doing everything, you know, doctors, lawyers, investment bankers, um, and then kids who are trying to save the world. <laughs> need more of that. Um, yeah. you do. When it comes to, you know, the academics, I'm sure is very rigorous. What does the athletics or the basketball program do to support the student athletes? Uh, to make sure they graduate. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, I mean, it, I knew right away when I got to Haverford that um, academic, academics were going to have a level of primacy that um, th that's never going to change. So, you know, when I have one of my players come to me and, and say, you know, hey, I really, 
um, I need to get to the speaker, you know, for, you know, this class and I might have to leave practice 30 minutes early or get to practice 30 minutes late or even miss a practice altogether. Um, I understand that, you know, it's not ideal for us, but it's, it's part of what it means to be a student athlete at a place like Haverford. You're going to have to make decisions every day about, um, you know, how you're going to spend your time and what, you know, what's going to be really important to you. So I'd like to think that, um, you know, as a coach, I, you know, I support my guys in their pursuit of academic excellence in the same way that I'm, you know, obviously supporting their pursuit of excellence on the basketball court. And, you know, when those two things conflict, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, they're going to they're go see the speaker or they're going to go, um, you know, if their professor needs something from them at six o'clock on, on Wednesday night, then, then we're going to figure out a way to make that work. So um, I've been really fortunate, you know, this, the seniors that I've had, um, you know, the three classes of seniors have all done really well. Um, I think we had the most members on, on the uh, honor roll in the Centennial Conference this year. So we have kids who are achieving their pretty high level academically. Um, and that's, that's because of their hard work. That's not because I let them leave practice 30 minutes. Early. It's a little testament to the coaching staff. I've got to give yourself a little credit. <laughs> you know, yeah. If you're going to coach, and, and this is not just at Haverford, if you're going to coach in the Ivy League or the Patriot League or the NESCAC or the Centennial, um, and you don't have that perspective, I think you're in for a long, hard road um, because um, – and don't get me wrong, basketball is, is really important to me and, and the young men that I coach. Um, but at the end of the day, they, they don't get it twisted. You know, they're at Haverford to, um, you know, to study and be great students and um, achieve what they want to achieve academically – and then at the same time, have a great basketball experience. So I, I see that as a huge part of my job to make that possible for them. No, oh, that's, that's awesome. Um, last question is, is in this environment where you're not, you know, flying across the country to different camps and tournaments and how, how can a player get on your radar? Um, obviously with no basketball going on. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really hard now. And, um, you know, like every other, you know, college basketball coach, I'm getting a ton of emails. Um, I'm, I'm, like Joe said earlier, you know, I'm trying to get through as many a day as I can. And I think what you can do is, you know, obviously you should have a really good highlight tape, you know, ready to fire out to a lot of different coaches at a lot of different schools. And then also have, you know, whatever your best game was that you played this past year in high school, or maybe your best quarter or your best half, um, have that ready to fire out too. Because if you get some reciprocal interest from a coach, you know, he's not just, you're not going to get recruited off a highlight video alone. He's going to want to see you in a full game or at least a half. Um, and then obviously, you know, you start the process of talking with parents and coaches and things like that. So. Um, there's not really a whole lot else, you know, coaches can be doing right now. Um, and, you know, in, until it's possible for us to get back out on the road, this, these are kind of the cards we've been dealt. So I'm trying to make the best of it. And, uh, you know, everybody that emails me, I read every email that's, that's sent to me. Um, and, I, you know, if there's video attached, I, I watch the video and I try to evaluate, you know, every kid that, you know, is interested in Haverford, I want to at least do that much for him. That's awesome. Well, yeah, and, and if people do have questions or want to send any information over to, to Coach Doherty, I mean, his email is in the chat. You can also go online and on the web, website for Haverford, and you can find it there. So, so reach out to him. Um, we got a couple more minutes here, Coach. So I wanted to ask you, you know, whether it was in your experience as a player being a walk-on at Lafayette versus now having that experience of being an assistant at that same school in the Patriot League, Division I, high academic, now to Division Three, high academic. You know, there's a lot of players, I'm sure, on this call and people that have gone through a similar process. You know, Division Three, high academic, Division One, Ivy League, or walk-on, something like that. So from you, from a coaching perspective, what is, what's the biggest difference for you in terms of what determines, you know, whether a kid should be a D3 
all American or be a, you know, big time player at the D three level, or maybe they go to D one and have a great experience. What, you know, what are some of those factors that played a role for you or some of the things that you think play a factors um, for kids now making some similar decisions as you had to in some of your players as well? Yeah, for, for me, it's tough because I, I was not, um, I didn't go through a recruitment process, you know, the same way a lot of kids do now. I mean, I, um, Lafayette was the only school that admitted me. So that's, <laughs> that's <laughs> there you go. Um, but to answer your question, I think, I mean, all those things are really important. I think if you're looking at, um, you know, high academic division three programs like ours, and you're looking at Ivy League schools and Patriot League schools, and you have those opportunities in front of you. Honestly, I think, you know, for a lot of, you know, high school student athletes, you should almost look at the schools and try to extricate basketball and say, okay, you know, if it's, if it's Lafayette and it's Haverford or it's Wesleyan or it's Johns Hopkins, and, and these are the options I have. And if the worst case scenario happens and COVID-19 lands and I don't have basketball, um, would I want to be there? Like, is it the type of play? Would I want to be with those guys? Would I want to be on that campus with that coach, you know, even when he's not coaching me? Um, and then, you know, allow that to kind of guide your, your process. Um, and then when once basketball factors back in and if you have great opportunities to walk on in division one and you want to challenge your, yourself and kind of prove to yourself that you can do it i've coached kids at lafayette that had you know that kind of massive chip on their shoulder and um, that works i've seen that work if you don't have that kind of chip on your shoulder and you want to have a great experience and you're talented enough um, you know, to play in the NESCAC or the Centennial and, and maybe get on the floor right away. And that's what you want. It's what's important to you. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing at all. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know how to answer that question from my own experience only because I didn't go through recruitment the same way a lot of, you know, kids go through recruitments now. Um, but the, the one piece of advice I will give is, you know, look at the schools and really do a lot of research and um you know dig into the schools and figure out like what, how is Haverford different than Wesleyan and not just with the, the basketball how is Haverford different than Grinnell um you know what's what is the character of the school like that maybe makes it a little bit different and will I be comfortable there you know given what I'm learning about it so um yeah I don't know if that that's I know I'm rambling a little bit, and I don't know if that really answers your question, but um, that's how I would think about it. Um, no, that, that, that was perfect. That was spot on. Um, well, the, the last question that I have for you, Coach, before we, we get off here, um, you mentioned, you know, Coach O at Lafayette, who you played for and, 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 and coached alongside, um, had a big kind of impact on you as a young head coach um, getting started, and you've tried to bring a lot of those philosophies with you to Haverford. So, you know, what is one thing that really stands out to you, some message or, or anything, experience that you had with him that has really carried with you to this day that you try to really embody every day with your team um, or, or a philosophy or a quote or, or something that you've really carried forward that, you know, I think would be cool to share? I'm sure yeah. there's a lot of them, so. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. You're actually going to make me embarrass myself right now, but um. That's okay. So the thing, the first thing that jumped into my head, uh, we were playing Holy Cross up in Worcester. This was probably my second or third year with them. Um, and there was a play where one of our guys got fouled and then there was a, an interruption of play. And um, I realized that Holy Cross didn't know who got fouled. And I said, coach, you know, we can, you know, they don't know that um, player X got fouled. You know, we can send player Y to the line and shoot these foul shots. It was a close game. Um, and he looked at me and I've never, I mean, you can't imagine somebody more disappointed or, or an expression that just conveyed such disappointment. And, you know, it was one of those lessons that I learned, um, probably too late in my coaching career, but for him, it was always about character and doing things the right way and being honest with yourself and honest with your team. Um, and I've tried to carry that with me. And as a, as a young coach in my competitive 
kind of fervor. You know, I'd sometimes, you know, I might lose that, but um, I won't lose it again. And I'm grateful for Coach that I had as much time as I did with Coach L because I was, I was learning from him. I, I mean, I was with him for, you know, almost 15 years. And right up until the very end, I was learning something new from him every day about basketball, about how to be um, a good person, um, a good mentor. And um, yeah, he's uh, if you ever get a chance to watch the, the Leopards play, it's, it's worth it. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's what I would say. It's, I mean, I, there's a lot of things I learned from Coach L, but that jumps, jumps out at me right now. Well, that's, that's not embarrassing at all. I thought you were going to tell uh, some other type of story. That would have been really embarrassing. So that was good. And I appreciate you keeping it, uh, you know, PG-13 for everybody here on. I'm sure you have some other stories. Um, but, uh, but in the, you know, last minute here, is there anything that we didn't get a chance to talk about or, or, or discuss at all that you wanted to just mention here before um, we wrap things up uh, for the evening? No, I, I really just want to say I appreciate you guys. I appreciate, um, you know, the invitation to come be a part of, you know, the Tuesday night talks. And um, for anybody who's listening, um, you know, please email me if you're interested in Haverford. And, you know, I'll be, I'll be excited to hear from you. And I appreciate you guys. And hopefully I'll, I'll see you on the West Coast here um, before too long. Yeah, hope, hopefully we'll, we'll all be able to be back in the gym. I know Scotty, Scotty misses seeing you you know, every step of the way and every gym that he goes to. So we're, we're, we're very hopeful that we get all get to be back in the court again soon. Um, but I'll be really there. Appreciate, be yeah, we know you will. We know. Uh, really appreciate you staying up late for us tonight, Pat. Um, Coach Doherty, uh, great job tonight. Thank you so much for all your support of West Coast League basketball. Um, you, you're doing an amazing job there. So please keep up the good work. Stay safe. And, and we hope to see you again soon. All right, guys. It's been my pleasure. Have a great night, okay? Appreciate you guys. Thanks. Man. Thank you. What's up, Coach? Can you hear us? How are you guys doing? Thanks for having me. Yeah, you got it. We're, uh, we're really excited um, for our third and final speaker tonight. The man, the myth, the legend head coach at Grinnell, um, coming to us live. How you doing tonight, Dave? I'm doing great. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was really enjoyable listening to um, Coach Riley, Coach Doherty. I, I, I sat here um, uh, re really just a, not in awe and not surprised, but it was, it was just so nice hearing some of the things that they had to say. And uh, I know both of those coaches. I, I know what their programs are all about. I, I credit you guys for getting them both on here because I, 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 I learn things. And I, I think that um, for, for what you guys are doing with, with everybody that's listening right now, getting them a chance to, to just interact and, and hear from different coaches, it, it, uh, it, it says a lot about what you guys are doing. Uh, we, we appreciate that very much. And yeah, we couldn't we couldn't do it without the coaches, and um, and so you're obviously a big part of that, and and so we really appreciate you being on tonight. So um, for everybody that's listening and maybe is is unfamiliar with you or, or kind of your background, give us a little bit and kind of what led you up to now as the head coach at Grinnell College. Yeah, so I'm entering my fifth year as the head coach at Grinnell College, which is located in Grinnell, Iowa, and um, I'm also a faculty member at the school. I'm also an alum of the institution, and I also grew up in Grinnell. My, my dad was the head coach at Grinnell for 29 years. I, I made a decision very early on that I, that I wanted to go to Grinnell, that I wanted to play for him. Um, I, I joined on his staff, and then I actually took and I spent two years away from Grinnell. Um, while still having a Grinnell mailing address, I spent two years as the head coach for an NBA D-League, now G-League team out on the West Coast um, in Reno, Nevada which was the Sacramento Kings D-League team. And so uh, then when my, when my old man decided that he was going to hang it up and he was going to retire, uh, it was a no-brainer for me to really just want to come back home. And, and um, obviously just having spent so much time around Grinnell and having gone to school there, I just have great passion for the institution. I, I believe in their mission and uh, I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to, to continuing to try to take our program to the next level. 
No, that's awesome. Must have been a uh, a very nerve wracking interview process for you uh, with your dad and uh, making sure that you had some some big shoes to fill, taking over for him. What what was that like? Uh, obviously, you had been around the program for so long. It just what what was that experience like to then you know have him pass the torch kind of to you to be the new head coach? Yeah, so you're right. It is big shoes to fill. Like when he came to to Grinnell back in in the in the late 1980s. Um, the program had really struggled and uh, you know he very this kind of leads into a little bit about our style of play but he very quickly just realized that he had to um, adjust his coaching philosophy he had to change the way that he wanted to coach and how his teams had to play and he had to take some type of uh, extreme measures and that's kind of evolved into what I'll get into a little bit more which is our running gun fast-paced system but um, no doubt big shoes to fill uh, he still lives in Grinnell. He and I, e- even right now during during quarantine and during self isolation, we 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 still we still find times to to hang out and talk hoops. And uh, uh, he and I get along really really well. But um, yeah, I'm having I'm having a lot of fun here uh, uh, at Grinnell. And and like I said, just look really looking forward to 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 continuing to try to take our our program to the next level. Yeah, definitely. And and um, you know, I think. I don't know really if anybody on the call, young people really have any idea about Grinnell, but um, you guys, like you mentioned, your style of play is very unique and very specific to how you guys play. So talk a little bit about that style, kind of what your dad started and how you've continued that style of play and what, what you guys are all about with your running gun. All right. So I know everybody's been here. You guys have been, uh, um, <laughs> you've been, you've been patient. You've been listening. I'm going to put you just through a tiny little activity. I'm going to, I'm going to ask coach Scott here. I'm going to ask coach Matt to participate in this little activity. Um, I know maybe it's starting to get late. So try not to fall asleep when I ask you to just, just close your eyes for, for roughly 10 seconds. And I want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine that your team is down by 10 points with a minute and 20 seconds left in the game, in the fourth quarter, in the second half, and whatever. And now I want you to think about the way that you're going to have to play to try to win the game, okay? And now you're free to open your eyes back up. You've had a chance to think about this. And what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to apply full court pressure. You you are going to have to gamble. You're going to have to go for steals. You cannot be afraid to get scored on at this juncture because really, if you get scored on, you're gonna you're, you're you're gonna probably lose the game anyway. So you might as well just gamble and go for steals. And then offensively, you're gonna have to race the basketball down the floor, and you're gonna have to take a quick shot, preferably a three point shot. Though getting all the way to the rim for a quick layup is 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 nice too. And um, that's how we try to play for a full 40 minutes. We, we, we never want to let the other team run a, a set play on offense. We never want them to be comfortable and be relaxed defensively because we want to be forcing the tempo. And, um, you know, a, a byproduct of that is that we've led the country in scoring in, in three-point field goals 20 different seasons. Um, we routinely average over 100 points per game. Um, you know, and, and, and we had a, a kid by the name of Jack Taylor, who in 2012, he, he set the NCAA scoring record and he, and he scored 138 points in a single game. And um, it, it now, the way that we play offense, I would say, is um, it's becoming more and more normal, I guess. You see a lot of teams that are trying to take threes, take shots at the rim, play, play with this positionless, open, free-flowing style of offense. And and I still think that our defense is 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 unique, um, in in some people's eyes, maybe a little bit too crazy, uh, but but it's it's the way that um, you know I learned the game. It's a it's a way that we try to have fun within our program, and and for us, it's given us a chance to to really compete at a level that we we haven't been able to um, because we're just so different from the way that everybody else tries to play. Yeah, no, it's really, really fascinating. I, I encourage people to take a look. You can watch some film and just see it. It's really amazing um, to see how you guys play. And that was a really cool exercise. Um, and I appreciate you, you doing that for us. I also needed a chance to close my eyes for a second. So that was, that was good. Um, but obviously on the basketball side, you guys do things at a very high level, very unique style of play. But um, on the academic side, you guys are also an incredible university and, and incredible school. So tell us a little bit about kind of on the academic side, campus life, what is, what is Grinnell all about? 
Yeah, so I mentioned that Grinnell is located in, in Grinnell, Iowa. And um, for those that haven't been to the great state of Iowa, I realized that maybe not every six, 15, 16, 17, 18 year old young man envisions themselves going to school in Iowa. Um, but I can talk to you about some of the, some of the benefits of, of, of doing just that. And um, first and foremost is, is the academics at the school. It's, it's one of the top liberal arts institutions in the entire country. Um, we, we recruit on a national and actually on a global scale. And um, we have players on our current roster from as far west as, as, as Hawaii. Um, and, and, and certainly California, including some, some, some WC alums, from, mm -hmm. from at least one from, from California, and as far east as, as New York, Connecticut, and everywhere in between. And um, 1,700 students, it's undergrad only. Uh, one of the nicest things about being in maybe a little smaller community or a little bit more of a rural setting is the facilities. We have state-of-the-art academic facilities, buildings, um, I'm hoping that many of you get a chance to see those in person this fall uh, and as spectacular as they look, even with some of the virtual tour stuff, really getting a chance to, to see the campus and, and meet the community is, is, is what, um, it, it, it's what makes Grinnell what it is. Uh, our athletic facilities are also just state of the art with a, you know, our, our, our main gym, there's an auxiliary gym that is, that is right off the main floor. You know, we have a we have a team film room that that is that is built in right off the right off the gym that's separate from our locker room, and it, and it really just has a lot of these bells and whistles that you maybe typically don't see at a Division three institution. And and um, with with the guys that we have on our team, I kind of mentioned a, a little bit of the geographic diversity, but but the same applies in terms of the majors, what they're interested in studying. Um, what they're going on to do with their lives. It, it is really and truly is all across the board. And the curriculum is set up in a way that when you arrive on campus, actually the only required class to begin with is the first year tutorial. And this is kind of a, a, a hybrid special topic class that just kind of introduces you to Grinnell. And, and it allows you then the flexibility to set up the rest of your schedule so that if you're unsure, of what you want to study. Now, maybe you, you have some ideas, but if you're unsure, it gives you the flexibility to really uh, um, check, those, check out those classes at the college level and, and kind of hone in on a direction before you have to declare a major. Yeah, and, and the other thing I think you, you mentioned in, the, in your introduction is really unique, and, and I know Coach Riley touched on it a little bit too, but not only being a basketball coach, but also being involved in other areas of campus, whether that's in the classroom and academics or other areas of athletics, I think that that really is a cool way to tie everything together and gives you kind of a cool breath and, and idea of what else is happening on campus, which is, which is really sweet. So um, I'm going to toss it over to, to Scotty and he'll ask you a couple more questions. Scott. Coach, appreciate you being on tonight. I, I actually had the pleasure to do a Zoom with your assistant a couple of weeks ago where he kind of broke down the Grinnell system um, to me and um, our, our staff at uh, the high school I coach at. How do you recruit to that system? What do you look for in players? Any specific attributes to play at Grinnell? Yeah, so uh, I, I guess what the first thing that we're looking at is 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 we're looking at the academic profile, and uh, that's that's not athletic related. I know, Coach. I'm going to get I'm going to get to the kind of the athletic related points, but we're looking at the academic profile. Um, we have just recently announced that we're going test optional at least for this year. You know, we're looking for, for um, certainly transcripts that have A's on them. The rigor of the class schedule is going to be incredibly important this year. And um, that's where we start, you know. And then after that, as we dive into highlight videos and, and game film, and uh, especially talking to your AAU and your high school and your club coaches to, to figure out who you are as a person. Because the, 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 the thing that is most important to me with the way that we play is – um, the intensity level that you're going to play with and uh, the team chemistry. And we play a lot of guys. We play between 10 and 12 guys on average in a given year, double digit minutes. Usually in, a, in, a, in any individual game, we'll play 15, 16, 17 players. And uh, we want guys that are going to buy into to the philosophy that are going to buy into to, to being a part of a team. And the, the chemistry is, is where it starts. So hearing just about your background, um, Hearing, hearing about what, what you like about the game, 
trying to figure out just how competitive are you. And, and um, from there, when we're talking about a skill set, what I found is that really, if you excel in one area and you, can, you have another, let's call it a secondary skill, then you're gonna be able to find a way onto the floor in our program. That's not to say that we don't recruit well-rounded players because we certainly recruit well-rounded players. But uh, really and truly, if, if, if you um, are a lights out shooter, if you are um, somebody that, that can just get on the, the, the glass and you can just rebound everything, anywhere, anytime, uh, if you can defend and you can play in the press and you have these instincts like a, like a think like a free safety in football, maybe that you can step up and pick off passes and, and, um, and, and, and wreak havoc defensively, then one of these skills, it's going to translate to our system. And we're going to find the right position for you within kind of our positionless style uh, to be able to play. I get the question all the time. I look through your roster. I know, you know, you have a West Coast League Hall of Famer and uh, Aiden Gilbert uh, on your team and some other guys who are, who are not blessed with, you know, being 6'7", six, 6'8", six, you know, more on the 5'11", 5'9", 6 foot. What, what do they have to do well to get playing time and get on the court? Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a good question. So, um, you, you know, you, you mentioned Aiden Gilbert. Aiden, Aiden came to us uh, this year in his first year. He, averaged, he ended up averaging 15 points a game. And he was somebody that, um, quite honestly, at the beginning of the season, didn't, didn't get a chance to play a ton. He's still learning, uh, figuring out, uh, transitioning to the college game. And then he just exploded down the stretch. And um, we're expecting huge things moving forward from him. But, but what's unique about our program is that in a lot of cases, when you're moving from high school to the college game, there is a big bump up in the level of physicality. And that's true in our games, but with the way that we play, so much of what we're doing is based on the speed, the agility, the quickness, uh, the extension of the shooting range back to the NBA line and beyond. Um, that really what it's, what it's more about is, is kind of your, your skill set rather than maybe adding 10 or 15 or 20 pounds in the weight room. And, um, you know, we have a strength and conditioning program that, that the guys are on. And we think that you're going to, as you get older, you're going to develop naturally. But, but a lot of what we do uh, there to get on the floor early is can you make decisions at a, at a high speed? Okay. And, and um, can, you, can you get shots off quickly? Can you get to the rim? You know, and, and, and just being able to play and use your instincts and, and play at a quick speed, it, it sounds like a really easy thing to do, but making decisions at, at warp speed, and, and we try to play at warp speed, is a, is a tough thing to accomplish. And um, that's, that's what ends up getting a lot of our guards on the floor. That's what ends up getting our guards to be, to be pretty statistically significant. It's just when they master that ability to, to, to make decisions at a high speed. And how, I know you have like a, a primary offensive player. How do you determine that going into a season? I, I mean, is there something those players who have practice you call it a, like a point player? Or, or what's the term? I know Coach uh, Levin went over that with me. Yeah, within the structure of our system, we, we um, depends. In the last few years, we've built kind of our, our groups, our playing groups that we have around a preferred playmaker. And uh, that can really be any player on our roster. The, the skill set that they have to have in order to, to, to play that spot is they really have to be a mismatch with, whoever, with whatever type of player tries to guard them, you know, so that they might be able to play on the, on the interior, actually, even though we want to shoot threes. They might just be able to get past anybody to get to the rim. Um, in, a lot of, in the secondary skill that they absolutely have to have if you're wanting to be in that preferred playmaking role for us is you have to, you have to be unselfish because when we, when, when we get to the basketball in, in your spots and you draw a double team, uh, we have a lot of shooters that are ready to space the floor and knock it down. And you got you to be able to move the ball so that it can start the domino effect so that we can get the shot that we're looking for. And you've been a big supporter of our West Coast League camps. I've seen you at other camps also. What do you look for in those environments? They're a little bit more chaotic, a little less um, unselfish. How, how, how do players in a normal environment when we do have camps stick out? Yeah, I think that it, I think that it just starts with you're playing a lot of games in a day. Um, so we're, we're evaluating constantly, at least for my program, we're evaluating your attitude. We're evaluating what kind of shape you're in. Um, we're evaluating 
um, is there is there a drop off in your energy level as as things progress? And uh, like I said, it's hard. I right now am in no condition to play as many games in a day as what I what I what I what I know some of the some of the people that are watching this are. But um, I, I, that's 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 where we start, you know. And we're of course evaluating skill sets and we're and we're checking. Um, we're checking the body language. We want to see guys that we know are going to be fun to coach, that we know are going to just buy into the chemistry that we have and enhance our team chemistry. And, um, you know, of course, of course, I already mentioned this, but guys that, guys that just like to compete, they like to play hard and, and, and they like to have fun while they're playing. And you were at, with the Reno Bighorns, is that right? Uh, yes. Uh, what – was the difference to you? How are those guys different? I know a lot of kids on this call obviously have the dreams of playing in, you know, the NBA, the pro, the pros overseas. What was the difference from you going from the college level to the NBA level or the, the G League level? Yeah, it was um, it was fascinating for me when I got when I got hired. I was uh, with with the Reno team. I was in my 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 mid to late twenties. Um, I actually had a few guys on the team that were older than me at the time, and and um, what really stood out to me uh, first and foremost was, was just their approach to, to the game. So certainly this is at the professional level, which means that it was, was their job. If you're coming to Grinnell, um, your, your job is your academics first and foremost. Okay. But that's, but we also want to take the basketball very, very seriously, but, but just their, their approach, there are a lot of skills that I, I find to be um, translatable, even to division three athletics. Um, how, how they showed how the, how the, how serious they took the stretching aspect, how serious they took the, the the film sessions when we watched and the questions that they wanted to ask and and after practice looking looking if they had the time um, to to see if there was a particular part of their game that they could work on and that they could develop. Off the court, they were making sure that they were getting enough sleep. They were trying to to do everything that they could to put the right things in their body, um, to, just to make sure that they were ready to go. And um, that for me was, was, um, was something that I was, I was just really fascinated by uh, seeing, seeing that approach. And like I said, I realize not all of that translates to, to Division three and to Grinnell College because, again, the primary reason you'd be coming to Grinnell is because of the academics. But there were certain aspects of that, just how they approached every, every day that, that, that I found to be pretty fascinating. That's awesome. Coach, you, you obviously played at Grinnell, went to Grinnell, moved on to pursue a career in coaching. Um, talk about some of the other things that some of your players, whether that was your teammates or players that you've gotten a chance to coach, whether as an assistant or a head coach, what are some of the things that they are now doing since graduating um, from Grinnell? Sure, I can talk about some of the guys that I graduated with, and then which was in 2009, so 11 years ago, and then and then transition even into some of the guys just more recently. Um, you know, within within my class, there there is there's one um, one guy that is is currently an athletic director and head basketball coach at a at a high school. Uh, there's one that went on to go to medical school at Yale, and uh, then did his residency in, in Ann Arbor at the University of Michigan. And is now on the front lines here as we as we battle this pandemic in what seems like every single day. Uh, another one that went to medical school at the University of Iowa and has now um, did his residency in Milwaukee is now back in Iowa. Uh, one that um, started started trading within the stock market and kind of started a little bit on his own and and um, and and has done pretty done pretty well. As I transition to some of the guys right now, we have a couple guys, recent graduates that that. Um, have gone to law school. Uh, we have uh, one guy, Vinny Curta, who graduated two years ago, who this past season, he played overseas and he was in, he was in Germany playing. And so um, really and truly, it, it can be all across the board. Um, there's not one major within our program that, that is, that is I, I, I would say, is noticeably more than, than, than other types of majors. And I, li I think that that's great. I think, I think that that is... Um, it's just another way that our team kind of has the chance to learn learn from each other um, just through some of those different experiences and those different interests. Yeah, definitely. And, and I'm going to make a plug. Uh, I know you mentioned earlier, maybe not a lot of people dream about going to school in Iowa. I went to school in Wisconsin and I love the Midwest. It's a great part of the country. I grew up in the East Coast, made it to the Midwest. Now I'm in LA. 
Um, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing part of the country. Talk about just from your experience, you know, you haven't been too far off, but you guys recruit across the country and, and globally as well. So talk a little bit about for players that might be from the West Coast that are on this call, or I know we have a lot of players on the East Coast as well as um, in different countries. What, what, what is it about going to a different part of the country, getting out of your comfort zone um, that you think is extremely valuable? It's something that maybe more people should look into. Yeah, I think I think that you, um, you you talked a lot about the Midwest and and the the friendliness is the word that comes to mind to me. Like in in at Grinnell College, the the sense of community that it doesn't have. Um, um, the, the I, I guess I, I I don't know. I didn't go to another school, but but I've I've heard maybe at some other schools there can be more of a cutthroat type type mentality and and even academically and it and it really just doesn't have that. It's a it's a place where um, it, it's a, it's a place where, where you're going to feel that community right away. You're going to feel that support. You're going to, you're going to feel it in the classroom. You're going to feel it from the athletics. You're going to feel it as a student athlete. And, um, I look at some of the other benefits of Grinnell, which are the safeness of the community, uh, our gym under, again, we're not in normal circumstances, but under normal circumstances, our, our gym is unlocked. You know, and you can get in there and, and the basketballs are unlocked and, uh, you know, from 6 a.m. till 11 p.m., you can get in there to get shots up and, and, and use the doctor dish machine and use the NOAA machine that we have on uh, attached to the wall and um, develop your game. And um, that type of accessibility, you, you learn where the lights are on your first day on campus. Those, those, those little things that, that, um, that I've now come to take for granted that, you know, the front door to my house right now can be unlocked and 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 there's there's no not a, I don't have a concern at all about that um and I, I realize that that's not true for every 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 place in this country but it, it is something that um that I really enjoy about Grinnell and talk talk really quick just um you know on the personal side or on the basketball side or you know whatever whatever things that you care to share um, you know, we talked with Pat in the last call about some of the things that Coach O had imparted on him that were so meaningful um, in his development as a head coach. What are some things that your dad kind of taught you along the way um, that you really now try to infuse into this next group of, you know, Grinnell players that you get to coach? Yeah, there's there's so many things. And, um, man, what, 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 what sticks out right off the bat is that there's – there's really no one correct way to play the game. And um, every, every player that we, we recruit, every player that comes into the, our program is, is, is different. They're different from each other. And, and rather than trying to um, take, take a player and, and, and fit him into exactly how I want him to play, uh, I try to just get the most out of his skill set. And I try to, try to let our guys be creative with, and do the things that they are good at, you know, and and then try to adjust our our system um, around around those skill sets. Um, you know, the the other thing that that certainly certainly my old man has impressed upon me is is the the motto of shoot first, ask questions later. Um, <laughs> I'm, 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 maybe maybe that's a bad thing to say that, that, you know, you, I can, I can envision a scenario where one of the players now comes to you, coach Scott, and he says, Hey, you know what? I heard coach Dave on the call say, shoot first, ask questions later, coach Scott, you know, but, but that's, that's, that's something that we, pra we practice. We play with the 12 second shot clock in practice. And, um, you know, it's, it's fun for our guys. I've, I've noticed that people that, that, that our student athletes, they, they don't mind getting yelled at if I'm yelling at them about, about not shooting or I'm yelling at them up that they need to shoot it, you know, yeah, and, and yeah. that's, that's, that seems to be an acceptable reason to, 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 to get yelled at. No, definitely. That's, yeah, that's pretty fine. I, I can imagine everybody coming up to Scott from now on saying, well, you know, we I thought we were going to be like a Grinnell, you know, we're going to play that style. So, um, but, you know, and you alluded to, you know, one of our guys, Aiden, that is now a freshman there. And you mentioned, you know, he started off slow, and then started to work into his rhythm and became more comfortable and then ended up finishing really strong. So, you know, just for some of the players that are on this call right now, give them a little bit of insight. What is that transition going to be like for them? 
you know, if not everybody has a ton of success right away, but for you, you know, what sort of opportunities do you give to freshmen and how, you know, how can you help navigate that transition from maybe going being that, that top dog on your high school team as a senior to now hitting the reset button and being a freshman in college? What's that transition like? Sure, it can be hard. Like, and I, I can tell you right now for our class of 2021s, we're looking to fill three or four spots. My expectation is that within our program, those three or four guys are going to be able to play for us right away. And that's, that's in, in large part because we, we play a, a, a deep rotation. Um, but the transition to college basketball can be hard with the physicality, uh, with the living away from home, with the, with the, if you're going to one of these super high academic schools, um, it's going to be more challenging for you in the classroom. And uh, I, I just encourage, I, I encourage the, 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 the young men that are looking at schools right now to, that when you do enroll, to, to be patient. And, um, you know, if you approach every single day, as it relates to your athletic experience, working hard, trying to get better, you come in with, with um, you know, tempered expectations of, of, of what you can do. Yes, we want you to be confident, but coming in, realizing that you're, you're, you're stepping into a different environment and you need to be patient and you need to soak up the, 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 the things that other people are talking to you about. Um, and then at the same time, you need to be ready and willing to play your game because there's a reason that, you, that a lot of these coaches were recruiting you and that they see something in you. And uh, they want you to be confident in, in, in your ability. And, and one, other, one other little, I guess, piece of, of advice that I would, I would give as you're kind of navigating the college search process, and it could be more challenging this year than others because of the uncertainty surrounding the summer schedule, because of the uncertainty surrounding visits to college campuses this fall. But what I would encourage is I would encourage uh, if you can, finding a school and you're looking to go to a super high academic school, seeing if you can apply early decision um, or, or, or early action if, if the school offers it, but early decision because um, while it is a commitment to the school, pending the financial aid, what that does is, is, is two things. One, it, 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 you'll, you'll know a lot about your fit within the program if the coach encourages you to apply early decision. Because if they do, that means that they really want you there. And that means that they're, 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 they're essentially, in a lot of cases, at least for us, that means that we're offering you a spot for one of those three or four spots. And then the other thing that it does is, is uh, when no spots at the school through admission have been filled, it uh, increases. If you look purely at the statistics, it, it increases the acceptance rate. And when you're thinking about some of these high academic schools, it's, it's incredibly challenging to, to, to get in. And so if you're ready and willing and able and you've done the research and you've, you've, you've done as much as you can to put yourself in a position to make a decision, I realize not everybody can get there, but, but that would just be a little bit of ad, advice that I would, I would give. And what, what would that look like if somebody was going to apply um, to Grinnell? What, what does that timetable look like for them? Yeah, so as soon as we know what our summer travel schedule is, um, then, then we distribute that information. So I, I would encourage anybody to, to, to contact me, to reach out to me. I know that there are, are people on this call that we've already been in touch with, but uh, we're still kind of in, looking to, to, to build our list so that we can uh, see players play over the summer. Um, which, which will hopefully be at some of these West Coast elite camps coming up uh, along with some other, some other uh, camps that we go to, which, are, which we, we travel across the country to, to, to try to see kids play. And um, then generally what our timeline looks like is hopefully sometime once school gets back started, then we figure out ways to, 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 for students to be able to, to come and check out campus. Of course, even before that, we wanna get a read on the academics. We want to connect you with our financial aid office or have you go through the net price calculator just to make, the Grinnell, make sure that Grinnell is going to be an affordable option. Um, and, and then after, after your visit, which again, I'm hoping you're going to be in person this year, but I, it still might be too soon to tell. Um, then, we, then we start figuring out what else you might need to know about the school or about other schools maybe to, to be in a spot to, to try to make a decision there. Um, sometime during the month of October or early November. And I realize that that can seem, seem very, very early and that not everybody can be ready at that time. But, but again, that's, that's still, even if it's, of course, it's, if it's not at Grinnell, as long as it's at a place where you feel comfortable and feel wanted, um, 
um, it's just going to improve your chances of, of not only getting into the school, but also, also, also just finding a home where, 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 you know, you're wanted by the coaching staff as well. Definitely. No, that's awesome. And, and, um, you know, for everybody that's on the call tonight, all, all of coaches contact information is email is, is in the chat. You can go on the website for the basketball program and you can find that as well. So definitely encourage you to reach out. Um, we got about one more minute here, coach, before we sign off. Is there anything that you wanted to, to discuss or, or, um, speak on before we kind of wrap things up for the evening? I just hope everybody's staying safe out there. I know that this is a, a an incredible, challenging time um it it makes you it makes me it's me it's given me a chance to spend a little more time with my family which has been nice but it's also made me appreciate some of the things that that that, that we have and um i'm very much looking forward to getting back in a gym uh, i'm very much looking forward to seeing see, seeing kids play and uh, you know so I, I just hope everybody's staying safe and and please do not hesitate to reach out uh, if you have questions about anything that I said, questions about Grinnell, questions about other other schools that might be a fit for you, I just like to see kids make not kids. I like to see young men make good decisions with with their with their next steps and and placing academics at the forefront of that conversation. Yeah, no, we we really appreciate that, Coach, and hope you're staying safe. I know you, like Scotty mentioned, you you guys and and your assistant coaching staff has done an amazing job um, at our West Coast Elite high academic camps and we're, we're hopeful that we can return to the court at some point. I know we're all itching to get back in the gym and um, we really appreciate you staying up with us tonight, spending some time with us. Uh, we look forward to hopefully seeing you again soon. Appreciate you sharing a little bit of your story with us and um, we're, we're looking forward. Hopefully we can make some good connections here for you with some of these guys on this call, um, but looking forward to, to seeing you on the court soon. Uh, stay safe, be well. Um, and if you need anything, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're here. Sounds great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. See you, David.